Good morning and welcome, everyone. Is the microphone working? Good. Uh, my name is Carolyn Berman, and I'm Chair of Humanities and Director of Jewish Cultural Studies at the New School. Thank you for joining us fairly early on a Saturday for a University for a Day, hosted by the Posen Foundation in collaboration with the New School's Jewish Cultural Studies program. I'm especially pleased to welcome Felix Posen, the founder and president of the foundation, as well as his colleagues from the foundation, the Academic Advisory Committee, and the Center for Cultural Judaism. Like other programs fostered internationally by the Posen Foundation, our Jewish Cultural Studies program at the New School explores Jewish cultural life with a particular focus on the contributions of Jewish thinkers and artists to secular, intellectual, and, art and cultural traditions. In the tradition of the New School, all of our courses are open to the New York community and can be taken for credit or non-credit. And I'm pleased to see several students from my courses in the audience here today, um, in addition to several of our faculty members. And I hope that some of you may also join us in future semesters. Our planned offerings for the fall include the literature of the Jewish American experience, a course on Franz Kafka, and an introductory course in Yiddish for the first time in our foreign language department. How do you describe a culture that is secular and Jewish? My eight-year-old daughter, Millie, had a wonderful idea, I thought. She came up with a new term, which is secularish. <laughs> so in the spirit of this newly minted word, I also hope that you will join us at an upcoming public panel on the art of the kvetch, Jewish humor as secularism. It will feature Michael Wex, who's the author of Born to Kvetch, and How to Be a Mensch and Not a Schmuck, among other works. <laughs> And it will also feature several New School colleagues, including Noah Eisenberg. And the date of that event is April 24th, no, 27th, sorry. Today, however, we are most honored to welcome a set of distinguished professors from across the United States and Israel who will share with us many versions of their courses in Jewish secularism. On behalf of my colleagues at the university, I would like to express our gratitude to Myrna Barron of the Center for Cultural Judaism for organizing this event, and to the philanthropist Felix Posen and the Posen Foundation, whose generous support have helped to make both the New School program and this unique day-long event possible. So thank you. And now I'm very happy to turn the microphone over to Laura Levitt, who will be one of our hosts for the day. And um, that means we get to sit up here and look at all of you. <laughs> um, I want to thank Carol, and um, I also want to thank Felix and Myrna and the Posen Foundation for their wonderful work. And we really are very appreciative of the New School and their program in um, Jewish Cultural Studies for um, or helping organize this wonderful event. And it's so nice to see the room sort of bubbling over. And so I hope that this is a wonderful omen for a really terrific day. So it's my privilege to um, introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker, and um, my colleague and friend, and really an astonishingly wonderful, prolific, and talented scholar, David Beale. Um, as you know from the program booklet, David is an incredibly accomplished author and scholar. Just to give you a little bit of a taste for what he does, at the present moment, David is the chair of the Department of History at the University of California, Davis. And um, he was honored, as you'll see in the program, uh, to win their prestigious prize for undergraduate teaching and scholarly achievement just this past year, 2011. Um, and he is also the Emanuel Ring uh, Ringelblum Professor of Jewish History, and he has been in this position since joining the faculty at UC Davis since 1999. Um, some of his books, as you'll see um, outside and you'll hear more about now, his brand new book, which um, some of you may have begun to read, and I encourage you to read it, is called Not in Heaven, The Tradition of Jewish Secular Thought. And some of his other works, um, which I highly recommend, include Eros and the Jews, From Biblical Israel to Contemporary America. And um, another is Cultures of the Jews, A New History, which is an astonishingly terrific collection, um, which really 
asks us to really reconceptualize how we think about Jewish history, which is very much what David's work does on many levels, whether it's about gender or sexuality, secularism, or material culture. Um, um, another one of his books, which I also want to mention here, is Blood and Belief, um, The Circulation of a Symbol Between Jews and Christians, which came out in 07. And so I'm going to hand the floor over to David, and um, I know it will be um, a, fan a fantastic talk. Thank you, David. I, I am a little, can you hear me? Is this working? Um, so I am a little bit concerned about people being able to see, see me here. So I, I'll try not to stand just at the podium. Um, uh, thanks a lot, Laura, for the wonderful introduction. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with a wonderful group of academics uh, over <clears throat> the last uh, six or seven years uh, in the Posen Foundation programs, um, which uh, uh, take place at various universities throughout the country, uh, promoting the study of secular Jewish culture, secular Jewish thought, and uh, the whole secularization experience of the Jews, which uh, we're all familiar with since we've all gone through it. Um, so I'd like to start actually with a quotation from a, an anonymous pamphlet from uh, the year 1789, uh, published in London. Uh, we don't know exactly where it was written. Um, and uh, it goes as follows. Those from the New World, the heretics and apostates, lie asleep on their beds until the time of the morning prayer has passed. After such a man has arisen from his bed, he does not hasten to do the work of the Lord but only after seeing to the needs of his home and partaking of other pleasures. Then he lays phylacteries to keep up appearances before the members of his household, and he takes care not to leave the phylacteries on too long, that's the tefillin, for fear that they, might have, that they might leave a mark on his forehead, <laughs> or that someone from his crowd might come and find him wearing the phylacteries, and that would cause him great shame. So they do not lay phylacteries, these people, saying it is, a, those are even more extreme than, than this particular character, saying it is a mere restrictive measure of the sages. And they deny any personal divine providence and say God's will is only that we ought not to do harm to any man, either in negotiations or in any other affairs. And we may eat and drink whatever we desire, meat and milk and non-kosher food, for in doing so we do not offend the Almighty. They scoff at the sages in regard to the fast and the leavened food, <clears throat> that you, mu you must stop eating six hours before the eve of Passover, saying, what will, <clears throat> what will the Almighty, blessed be his name, gain or lose if we do not or, or do all of these things? So here is a wonderful sort of uh, 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 portrait in kind of encapsulated form of the... Um, of the secular Jew uh, on the uh, eve of the modern era. Uh, I've taken this quotation from a wonderful book, which is actually, I, I believe, on sale outside uh, by uh, the Israeli scholar Shmuel Feiner called The Origins of Jewish Secularization, uh, which shows the sort of <clears throat> um, emergence of a kind of Jewish deism, that is a belief that God may exist but plays no real role in the world, um, that uh, the commandments uh, of rabbinic Judaism are essentially the inventions of human beings uh, and that one can create an entirely new world without, uh, without following them. Now, what interests me in this talk um, is where does this come from, this um, a sudden eruption in the 18th century of a Jewish secularism. I'm not going to talk about the social origins of Jewish secularism, um, and uh, Feiner does a wonderful job of this. What interests me in this talk, uh, as in the book that was referred to, um, is uh, the ideas of Jewish secularism. Uh, where do they come from? What is their relationship to the Jewish uh, tradition, the Jewish religious tradition? And I want to offer as my thesis or my argument for today's talk uh, three points uh, that are related. The first is that Jewish secularism is a tradition. What do I mean by tradition? It is a, a set of ideas that are passed on uh, that in which one writer refers to an earlier writer, is influenced by an earlier writer, sometimes uh, in direct 
uh, in a direct way, sometimes in an indirect way, sometimes even in opposition to an earlier writer. But this is a tradition of ideas. It's not simply a random collection of books uh, and ideas, but instead something that exists in a coherent chain. So that's, that's thesis number one. Thesis number two, the tradition is, this secular tradition is anchored in the Jewish religious tradition, not just as a rejection of it, but as a dialectical working out of some of its uh, ideas or some of its impulses, even if those impulses were not entirely conscious to uh, the Jewish religious tradition. And therefore, and this is point number three, this uh, Jewish secular tradition is actually an integral part of the Jewish tradition as a whole. It is a part of it. Uh, it is not a completely separate entity, uh, uh, a, a complete, uh, it, it is not defined only by negation. Now, the relationship between the secular and the religious is uh, one that has preoccupied uh, uh, historians, philosophers, now for many, many decades. Uh, an argument made by Max Weber, a very famous argument, uh, holds uh, that uh, Protestantism is the uh, source of modern secularization. Uh, that was an argument taken up by, uh, by Peter Berger, uh, a sociologist uh, still working today. Um, this argument tended to see the modern as a kind of rupture from, uh, the, uh, from, the early, from earlier religion. Uh, Weber uh, found that point of rupture in the Protestant Reformation. Others found it later in the Enlightenment. But more recently, uh, the last several decades, there have been those who have argued that the connection between secularism and religion is a much more dialectical process. I want to uh, refer, uh, uh, first of all, to a, a French uh, philosopher, uh, Marcel Gaucher, who wrote a book called The Disenchantment of the World. That's a phrase, actually, he took from Max Weber. And what, what Gaucher argues is that actually the monotheistic traditions in banishing the gods from the world took the first step towards secularization. That in fact, secularism lies at its heart actually in this movement that starts, uh, uh, at least with Judaism, already 3,000 years ago. This is a very radical kind of point of view. Another argument of this sort, although not quite as uh, long term, uh, was that of my own teacher, Amos Funkenstein, uh, who wrote a book called um, uh, Theology and the Scientific Imagination. What he argues in that book is that the um, originators of the 17th century scientific revolution actually took their categories from medieval scholasticism. But they emptied these categories uh, of their religious meaning and filled them with new secular meaning. Categories such as God's omnipotence, uh, God's omnipresence, and God's providence. These ideas become modern concepts, um, uh, but they do so in a kind of dialectical fashion. That is, these thinkers are immersed in the medieval categories, but they make them mean something very, very different, and thereby pave the road towards modernity. Now, the problem with a lot of these arguments is that they are based essentially on an analysis of Western Christianity. They don't pay attention to the fact that there are many different types of secularism. In fact, we should really speak of secularisms and not in the singular. And that in fact, probably every type of secularism, whether it occurs in India, in Turkey, in China, reflects the religious tradition out of which it emerges and which it rejects. In other words, this dialectical kind of um, development that both Gaucher and Funkenschein um, lay out for us 
takes place in a different fashion in every uh, religious tradition. And so what interests me in particular then is what are the distinctive features of this move in the Jewish tradition? What are the categories that the, uh, uh, the Jewish tradition uh, uh, or the Jewish secular tradition adopts from the religious tradition, empties of their religious meaning, and fills with a new meaning? What I'm going to argue is that <clears throat> there are three categories. Um, that uh, there are kind of broad categories that you will all recognize uh, if you have set foot in a synagogue, because every rabbi uses them. Uh, namely, God, Torah, and Israel. These are thought to be the sort of, if you will, the Jewish trinity of <laughs> ideas that, uh, that defines Judaism. By the way, these three ideas, God, Torah, and Israel, come from the medieval Kabbalah, from, from the Zohar, um, where they are actually seen as equivalent to each other. Uh, but they're taken over in the modern period, and this is actually a separate story, it's very interesting to see how these Kabbalistic categories are taken over by reform rabbis, um, which, uh, which shows you also another way in which um, certain ideas that, uh, that come from one setting arrive in a different setting um, and, and come, up, uh, come out to mean rather different things. So in the Jewish case, I want to argue, these three categories are those that are going to shape and define the character of Jewish secularism. Now, it seems to me that uh, Judaism has its own particular understandings of categories like the holy and the profane. <clears throat> and uh, if we look back to um, uh, Talmudic literature, rabbinic literature, we find that uh, categories of profane uh, in Hebrew, chol, or uh, another word that's used is chiloni, which was adopted in modern Hebrew as the word for a secular Jew. These categories are actually what I would call intermediary categories. They are somewhere between the holy and the polluted, or the unredeemed. In other words, the secular, if we now translate uh, chol or chiloni in that fashion, in traditional Judaism already occupy a position that is somewhere in the middle. In other words, the Jewish tradition may, uh, opens up the possibility of the secular as something which is not simply negative or polluted. Um, and, and that seems to me to be actually quite an interesting um, a sort of mental universe, um, which we have already in rabbinic Judaism. Um, because in fact, uh, and this of course is, uh, is a virtual truism, uh, Judaism does not reject the material world. It does not, as, as Christianity does, reject this world in favor of, uh, uh, of a heavenly world but in fact sees this world as the place where one is supposed to work out um, a God's will. And so therefore the, the affirmation of this world sets the ground, and this is a kind of argument Marcel Gaucher I think would, uh, would agree with, uh, sets the ground or sets the basis for uh, a kind of secular affirmation of the world. Now there's a story uh, from which I took the title of my book uh, which I'd like to uh, relate to you, and you've probably all heard it in one form or another because it's, it's become a very famous story, um, the oven of Achnai. This is a uh, debate in the Talmud about a particular type of oven as to whether it is kosher or not. Now, of course, what's interesting about this story is it doesn't really matter whether it's kosher or not. It's rather the rabbis actually are going to learn something completely unrelated to the oven in telling the story. So what happens is all of the rabbis declare it um, uh, unclean, and one rabbi, uh, Rabbi Eliezer, declares it clean. I can never actually remember if it's that way or the other way around. And as I say, it doesn't really matter. So there's one outstanding rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer. He's in, the, uh, in a minority of one. <clears throat> the 
he invokes all sorts of divine miracles on his side. He makes water run uphill. He makes the, uh, the walls of the, uh, the academy uh, lean inward. And finally, when the other rabbis are not impressed by these miracles, he, he invokes uh, or he, he brings in sort of the big gun, namely God himself, and has God, uh, in the form of a divine voice, uh, say whatever and whenever there's a dispute, the law always goes according to Rabbi Eliezer. Well, you'd think that that would decide the matter, but no, the rabbis say, we do not listen to a heavenly voice. It is not in the heavens. It, meaning the Torah, is not in the heavens. It is here on earth, and we will decide what it means. And they go on to prove this point by quoting verses from the Bible, in other words, from God's own revelation, to show that God himself has already um, uh, endorsed the view that the Torah is in the heaven and uh, is not in the heavens, and that we are going to uh, decide it here on earth. Now, as it happens, what they do is they distort the meaning of the verses in the Bible to serve their purpose, which also is a form of um, uh, a sort of human autonomy uh, saying, we will decide what the Bible means, even if it doesn't mean what it seems to literally mean. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to uh, argue that this story proves that these rabbis are secular. They're not secular at all, and the, the very category of secular is inappropriate uh, in thinking about a religious tradition, just as even the word religious is inappropriate. These are categories that are, in, in effect, modern categories. But what we do see in the story is a very interesting kind of um, separation between God on the one hand and his revelation on the other. A kind of declaration of human autonomy, to be sure, within a religious framework. And in fact, in the story, the rabbis have God say, my sons have defeated me, my sons have defeated me. That is, God also endorses their position. But of course, because they bring God in through the back door, it's not as if they have ruled him out altogether. So clearly what we have here is not modern secularism by any, any stretch of the imagination, but what we do have is a kind of a impulse, a mentality, which says that at least for the rabbis, there is autonomy from God. And so <clears throat> I bring this story as an illustration of the possibility that there are moments within the Jewish religious tradition that could be exploited, maybe even against their intent, for a later modern secular philosophy. Now what I want to do, <clears throat> and for the remainder of my time, uh, is to turn to the three um, uh, categories that I've laid out for you, uh, God, Torah, and Israel, and very briefly sketch out what I mean by the relationship or the way in which modern thinkers have taken these categories <clears throat> have found in uh, medieval thinkers the possibility of, uh, of a kind of secular point of view. I'm not going to cover all the possibilities uh, uh, that there are within these categories. I've tried to sketch them out a bit in, in the book. Um, but I just want to give a, couple of, uh, a number of illustrations. So first of all, the cate category of God. Now obviously there are uh, Jewish secular thinkers who reject God as a, as a possibility altogether. And, and one person who is particularly of interest to me is, is Sigmund Freud. Um, particularly in his uh, small essay, The Future of an Illusion, in which he, uh, uh, he demonstrates that God is an illusion, uh, a projection of human wishes onto the heavens. Interestingly, he does this, um, uh, he argues that it is Judaism that has brought us closest to his psychoanalytic theory of an illusion. So Freud already recognizes that the Jewish religious tradition has provided him the background, the understanding, uh, for 
uh, for this kind of a um, uh, this kind of a move. And that's actually a rather startling moment in the future of an illusion uh, when he uh, he says that the highest form of this uh, illusory thinking is actually uh, when one declares oneself uh, the chosen son. And obviously, he's referring here to Judaism. So there is that possible move. But there are other thinkers who, in fact, do not wish to dismiss the category of God altogether, but instead um, uh, re-inhabit the category with entirely new ideas. And a key figure here, and indeed a key figure for the history of Jewish secular thought, is the 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Now Spinoza was excommunicated by his community and as far as we know never looked back, would be astonished probably to hear himself described as the first secular Jew. Doubtful that he would want to endorse such a, an identity. But he's been adopted by a whole tradition of thinkers as in fact exactly that. Spinoza famously argues that God is the world. There is nothing outside of the world or the universe, nothing transcendent. This is a very extreme form of pantheism, quite obviously a heresy from the Jewish point of view. I believe that what Spinoza has done is to take uh, Moses Maimonides, the great 12th century philosopher, <clears throat> taken Maimonides' theology and turned it, turned it on its head. Maimonides argued that God is utterly transcendent, that God shares nothing with the world. God disappears, so to speak, into, a, uh, into an abstract void about which we can say nothing positive. We can only say what he is not. And from the point of view of the history of ideas, Spinoza looks like he has taken that idea at its most extreme and then turned it around so that there is nothing outside of the world. The world is all there is, and the world is God. Very interesting position. The, the German philosopher and uh, poet Novalis said of Spinoza, he was the God-intoxicated man. In other words, this is not atheism by any means. This is a kind of uh, uh, belief in God, but one that is, a, uh, is, from the Jewish point of view, an entirely heretical one. But we can see that if we, if we accept this idea of, a, of uh, uh, an intellectual tradition which Spinoza uh, finds himself in, uh, which I believe he is in, He's in other traditions as well. He's not only within the uh, Jewish philosophical tradition. But insofar as he is a uh, chain in the Jewish philosophical tradition, he has emptied Maimonides, he has emptied medieval Jewish philosophy of its tendencies towards um, a transcendent God, and it substituted instead an entirely imminent or pantheistic God. Second category. Uh, Torah. <clears throat> Here, <clears throat> Spinoza, who is one of the originators of modern critical readings of the Bible, of a historical reading of the Bible, quite explicitly relates to another medieval thinker, Abraham Ibn Ezra. Abraham Ibn Ezra, also lived in the 12th century, <clears throat> develops a reading of the Bible which is, um, uh, uh, which is literal and which is imminent. That is, you can only learn about, uh, you can only uh, solve problems within the biblical text from the biblical text. You cannot import philosophy into the Bible. When he makes this kind of an argument, what he's really saying is that the Bible uh, is a book like any other book. It does not contain all knowledge. Once you take that position, you are already on the road to a very radical point of view, because in the Middle Ages, what philosophers were interested in doing is showing how the Bible, in fact, can be reconciled with all the teachings of philosophy. So Ibn Ezra is already setting the stage <clears throat> for 
a spinocistic reading of the Bible, namely the Bible is simply a book in the library, not the book. It's God. <laughs> exactly. It's in somebody's coat. I'll refrain from all the possible interpretations of this call. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what we find then in Spinoza is a, the first step in a reading of the Bible, not as a religious text, but as a text that contains other kinds of messages. Now, one reading of Spinoza, and this I think is probably a correct reading, is he actually tried to demote the Bible to the point where it would actually have no, no, we would have no reason to read it at all. And there were certainly Jewish secularists who took that position. The Bible is just a pack of lies. It's just a bunch of oriental myths, um, superstitions. Um, but uh, in fact, I think Spinoza is also open to another kind of interpretation, that the Bible contains the history of an ancient people. And that history uh, is still of interest to us. It, is not necessarily relevant to how we live our lives, but it does chart out the beginnings of the Jewish people. Now, Spinoza wasn't interested in the continuation of the Jewish people as far as we know, but in the hands of other thinkers, this move already becomes a very important one. The Bible becomes a cultural document, uh, a historical document. Uh, this is very much in the, in, in the lines of what uh, other Enlightenment thinkers, uh, non-Jewish Enlightenment thinkers, do with the Bible. Uh, Jonathan Sheehan has written a wonderful book called The Enlightenment Bible, which shows how the Bible is trans translated into Enlightenment terms, um, no longer in its sort of orthodox religious terms. And I think that these uh, authors are doing the same thing. A variety of Jewish secular thinkers, Freud again is one of them uh, in his Moses and Monotheism, uh, translating the Bible into his own terms, which as it happens are the, uh, the early history of psychoanalysis. The final <clears throat> category uh, is uh, Israel. And what we find in these secular thinkers is the development of an identity or identities for Israel which are not necessarily religious. After all, the Bible speaks of um, uh, the relationship between God and, uh, uh, and the Jewish people as one of covenant. And that is certainly one way of defining the Jews as a covenantal people. But one can also speak of them in other terms. Um, as, a, uh, as a nation, as a race, uh, as an ethnicity. Once again, Spinoza lays out a possible trajectory for such an identity, because what he argues in his um, uh, uh, theological political treatise is that the Jews, in fact, in the Bible, have really very nothing to have nothing to tell us philosophically, but they have something to tell us politically. They are a people who are uh, kind of political geniuses, which is an, a kind of amazing thing to say in the 17th century. Nobody thought of the Jews as a political people. Spinoza thinks of them in these terms. And making that kind of an argument lays the basis for a later kind of uh, nationalistic use of the Bible, as, for example, David Ben-Gurion uh, does. The Bible is therefore uh, a book that is not only a book of a religious covenant. So these are examples, very brief examples, of the way in which uh, different uh, thinkers have taken these categories and infused them uh, with new modern ideas. Spinoza being a fulcrum kind of thinker, one referred back to by many later thinkers as a kind of foundational, uh, foundational uh, philosopher. Again, as I said, he probably would not be entirely happy with uh, uh, being crowned the first secular uh, Jewish thinker. 
But this is indeed how he was, uh, how he was understood by many of these, these later thinkers who construct a Jewish secular tradition uh, based on, uh, on Spinoza and indirectly based on the reinterpretation of medieval thinkers as progenitors, precursors of a Jewish secular point of view. Now, I, wa I want to conclude um, with some reflections on Jewish secularism as a tradition um, and, uh, and where we are today. When one thinks of Jewish secularism, not so much from the point of view of books and ideas, but instead uh, in terms of movements, political movements, cultural movements. The high water mark of Jewish secularism was probably the turn of the 20th century. When one had movements like secular Zionism, uh, Bundism, Yiddishism, uh, autonomism, uh, that really captured the imagination of many Jews and seemed to speak to their situation, uh, particularly that of Jews of Eastern Europe um, at that time. These movements have either passed from the scene or have, uh, in the case of, of Zionism, succeeded in at least in establishing uh, the state that, uh, uh, that it imagined. So I think we can say that today there is no such thing as a Jewish secular or Jewish secular movements. We do have, uh, as a member of the audience uh, remind, reminded me beforehand, and, and I agree with him, <clears throat> uh, some organized groups such as the secular humanistic uh, movement here in the United States, uh, as well as in Israel and, and in uh, various countries in Europe. But one can't really speak of a Jewish secular movement in any mass uh, sense. Actually, the ideological battles between secularism and its religious opponents um, have, to some extent, waned, especially outside the state of Israel. And Israel is a special case, of course, because the rabbis still hold political power. Um, and therefore, secularism has a has a political edge that it, uh, it probably doesn't elsewhere. Um, I assume that to be the case, although I've actually noticed from uh, one or two reviews of my book, uh, actually very negative reviews of my book, that there's still an edge to these ideas today. That is that people still, um, you know, still get very exercised over the assertion that there might even be such a thing as a Jewish secular tradition. So I'm not so sure that the battles are fully over at all. But I, I do think that um, uh, today uh, the question is to what degree uh, will these ideas, uh, these ideologies, uh, continue to have a life? And I think we don't, uh, we don't know for sure. My argument in this talk has been that the Jewish secular tradition is not an autonomous one. It is always in dialogue and disputation with the Jewish religious tradition. It's unclear whether it can stand on its own. I actually, uh, <clears throat> my, my niece, who is a, uh, in Chabad, in Lubavitch, uh, and, and read, uh, she read the book, and she's a very intelligent uh, uh, woman, and she said, I've concluded that the Jewish secular tradition will only continue if every couple of generations a secular Jew becomes religious, if <laughs> only in order to rebel against it. I thought that was rather perceptive. So <clears throat> I think we're going to see many different uh, manifestations of Jewish secularism in the day ahead of us. Um, and I think we should be asking ourselves the question of uh, what is the status of these, uh, of these ideas how does it relate to the Jewish religious tradition? Uh, what, is it, uh, what are its possibilities for continuity? Thanks a lot. I'm going to let you call up people. No. OK, sure, please. Please, you get the microphone. Yeah. Um, do we have another microphone? Uh, thank you for your talk. And I totally agree for whatever that means. But how would you distinguish Jewish secularism from 
other secularist yeah. movements, Christian or what have you. So, you know, my argument is, and, and you, you could say that I've sort of made my life easy by defining my topic in such a way that it, that it fits with how I want to describe it. Um, uh, what I'm arguing is that the Jewish secular tradition has to be seen, it, that a secular thinker, to qualify as a Jewish secular thinker, has to be in this kind of dialogue with the, uh, the Jewish tradition uh, writ large. Um, that a thinker who is not, and, and, and that could be even in a historical fashion, doesn't have to necessarily be you know, reading Maimonides and trying to reinterpret him. Um, so in the book, for example, I, I actually make a very deliberate move of excluding from my uh, pantheon, if you will, of Jewish secular thinkers, um, the uh, uh, people who happen to be born Jewish um, but really, in their thought, do not engage with the Jewish tradition as a whole. So, you know, a kind of parade case would be Karl Marx, born Jewish, converted, uh, you baptized at age six. Uh, Marx, of course, writes one, um, uh, you know, very problematic essay on the Zur Judenfrage, on the Jewish question. Uh, actually, an interesting essay uh, in the sense that he defines the category of the secular Jew in that essay. Um, uh, that is uh, the Jew who is defined, according to him, uh, by the category of money. Um, I mean, one can say a lot about Marx's essay, but that's all Marx ever had to say about the Jews. And uh, so for me, he doesn't really qualify except for that particular move that he makes right there. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in, the, in Jewish secularists not in secular Jews, if you understand the difference. A secular Jew is somebody who might be born Jewish, have no relationship to the tradition at all. Um, such a person can be studied under the broader category of secularization for sure. And it's a very important subject, but that's not, I, I'm defining for myself a narrower kind of field. I'm going to let him call. Uh, over here. Oh, just please, one, please, one second, one second. Just get <laughs> oh, just following on that, when, when I use the word secular, people are very confused. There's secular government, secular people, secular ideas. So I just wanted to just check in with you as to what you feel the definition is of secular, secularism and so on. Yeah, so I think that... Um, <clears throat> I think we need multiple definitions because uh, there are, for example, the uh, separation of church and state is normally considered to be a secular position, and certainly it's part of a, uh, a long tradition in the West of, um, of just such an idea. And that, that idea is linked to indirectly, sometimes directly, to metaphysical ideas, that is, is there a God or isn't there a God? But one can believe in the separation of church and state, uh, a secular principle, while at the same time, for example, being um, religious. Uh, most Orthodox Jews in the United States probably believe in the separation of church and state. Um, they may not believe it for Israel, but they do believe it for <laughs> the United States, which is kind of interesting. So you, you can have a position that may be your, your sort of metaphysical belief system may be theistic, but on that score you are, uh, you are secular, and, and also vice versa. I mean, there, so there are many different, um, I, I would say, uh, a number of different areas of, uh, that would define the secular. Um, there's the metaphysical, there's the political, uh, there's the historical. Um, and uh, uh, there's the cultural. So there are different possibilities for defining a, a secular position. And they don't all have to come together in one package. You started to talk about Ibn Ezra, and then somebody's phone went off, and you forgot completely about the track. You, back, you went back to Spinoza. So maybe you can fill us in on Ibn Ezra. I'm interested, anyway. Yeah, well, there's a lot more to say. Um, so, so Ibn Ezra, in his um, biblical exegesis, um, 
He's perhaps best known for his um, theory of interpolations. That is, that there are uh, verses in the Bible, in the, in, the, in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible, that were not written by Moses, that had to have been written later. Um, and this is already a uh, pretty radical position to take in the Middle Ages. Um, in order to get to that position, you, al you already have to be thinking historically. Uh, that is that certain, certain verses could not possibly have been written by Moses because they presuppose later knowledge. Now, obviously, you could say Moses wrote them prophetically, but Ibn Ezra seems to dismiss that possibility and to adopt instead what we would, I think, today call a secular historical reading of the Bible. Now, those interpolations are not the most important part, in my judgment, of his philosophy. The most important part is this idea that <clears throat> the Bible um, is a book that has to be quarantined from philosophy. That you shouldn't bring philosophy to bear on the Bible, because the Bible is not a book of philosophy. It concerns, as he says, the sublunar world. And the sublunar world, this is according to uh, uh, Aristotelian um, uh, philosophy, is a, uh, that's, that's our world. Philosophy concerns itself with the superlunar world, the world of the constellations. Um, this, these are moves that, as I said, uh, uh, Spinoza picks up on and he runs with them. He, he, he uh, makes Ibn Ezra out to be a much more radical philosopher than he actually was. He, he concludes that, um, according to Ibn Ezra, um, uh, Moses didn't write any of the Torah. It, it was all written by Ezra um, in, the, in the 6th century, 6th or 5th century. Um, <laughs> The, Ibn Ezra never actually says that or anything close to that. Um, what you can see then is a, um, what I'm trying to show is the way in which uh, Spinoza uses a medieval thinker for his own purposes. Now, another thing about Ibn Ezra that's very interesting is he, he describes to you a number of thinkers, uh, some of whom he names, some of whom he does not name, who existed in his intellectual world who were much more radical than he was. We don't know of them except from Ibn Ezra and sometimes from references by other authors. We don't have their own, their own writings. And what they seem, what the picture we get is that the 12th century was a time in which there were people thinking very radical thoughts. Um, so uh, there's a lot more to say on Ibn Ezra, but um, if, you know, for my purposes, he, he, he's not a secular Jew. But he provides some of the arguments for, uh, for later secular Jews, particularly in this case, Spinoza. Uh, Let's see, uh, this gentleman way back here. You posited, um, one of your hypotheses was that there's a dialectic going on between um, current and um, tradition. Um, and religious, Jew, uh, religious Judaism. And then you mentioned a number of examples, um, or you called maybe the heyday of Jewish secularism, such as you know, Buddhism, Yiddishism, Zionism. That was also a dialectic with what's going on in their secular communities. You know, in the, not just the Jewish community, necessarily, but you know, Zionism was an expression, perhaps, of nationalism, and Buddhism, and socialism, and so on and so forth. And it took place in a very specific time when there's a lot of ferment going on. Yeah. If you don't have the same ferment going on, such as in America, I'm, I'm just thinking about the future of secularism, because I'm, I'm assuming that there's a positive reason why, we ha I mean, there's something positive about Jewish secularism. So how does it advance? How does it keep on going forward if you don't necessarily have the same social conditions in, um, in place today? <clears throat> yeah. Um, fortunately, I'm not a sociologist or a prophet, so I don't have, <laughs> I, I don't have to have a coherent answer to your question. Um, uh, but I, but I agree with you. In other words, I th the reason that those movements were mass movements at the time was uh, it was a time of radical upheaval of you know um, political radicalism, uh, mass emigration, urbanization, uh, transformation of the traditional Jewish community into something very very different. Actually, the collapse of the traditional community is what we now know. Um, so and this in turn. You know, uh, spawn these different uh, these different mass movements. Um, we don't have those conditions today. 
Um, this is one reason that I actually would be, um, th that I'm sort of pessimistic about those who think that Jewish secularism can continue or can be what it was then. I don't think it can. But what I do think is that um, the ideas that uh, uh, I've mentioned here actually still speak to people. Uh, and this I can testify to from my own teaching. Um, I developed a course as a result of the grant we had from the Posen Foundation on secular Jewish thinkers. Actually, the book grew out of the course. It was, it was a book developed in teaching. Um, and I saw there the uh, students, undergraduate students, Jewish and non-Jewish, um, some with you know, real back, religious backgrounds, others with nothing at all, found these ideas enormously relevant. Um, uh, they continue to speak to them. Uh, in particular, Spinoza, I have to say. Uh, Spinoza, of all the, the people I teach in that course, tends to get the, the best reaction. The students come up after the first session on Spinoza, and they said, I'm literally quoting them, you just blew my mind. <laughs> Spinoza still has the capacity to blow people's minds. And therefore, you know, I take heart in this, that, that there are these ideas that are enormously stimulating. And by the way, it's not just secular ideas. I mean, Maimonides often gets a similar reaction because he forces you to think beyond your normal categories. And, um, you know, I think as long as people are uh, excited by ideas, then uh, hope is not lost. Uh, and that's the best I can offer. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, maybe from this side. Oh, we can or take one or two. More. Okay. I'd have to take issue a, a little bit with your statement <clears throat> that uh, Spinoza felt that the Bible was a historical um, a document. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, he pointed out that many of the incidents in the Bible were superstitious myths, like uh, parting of the waves, the, the uh, Red Sea, and so on. The only part of the Bible that I think he did recommend people to read and, and live by were the moral ethical commandments uh, as a sort of a basis for a religion. Am I wrong? About no, no, that? you're right. You're certainly right about that. I mean, he saw the Bible, and insofar as the Bible still had relevance, it was as a moral document uh, that could be used, uh, put to use by, um, by political rulers. Um, to create a, a, a good society. But <clears throat> I think that, it, and Spinoza doesn't really have a category of history as such in his philosophy. But sort of unwittingly, he, is, he has given us that. Because uh, what he does tell us is that the Bible, when stripped of all of these uh, miracles that, that he thinks are, are, are mythic, um, various superstitious ideas about God, at the core, the Bible is a political history of ancient Israel. And it turns out we can also learn something about the formation of states. The, the formation of uh, the ancient Israelite state, according to Spinoza, actually follows the pattern of a social contract and a kind of a primitive democracy. It's very interesting. And then it becomes a theocracy. Um, but. Uh, uh, he has presented us with a reading that is actually a historical reading of ancient Israel. Over here. Uh, I had uh, two thoughts. One, I really liked your pointing out of the word whole, uh, because uh, for religious people, at the end of the Havdalah service, uh, you say the phrase, Habavdil Ben Kodesh Lechol, stating, you know, sort of behind the scenes that six-sevenths of life are whole. Um, so it just kind of puts it into, you know, perspective and the dialectic. Also, the um, story about the oven, uh, I, I did find an aspect of that troubling in terms of the modern day gives justification for the rabbis to be saying, you know, women can't pray at the wall because we say so, and it's okay for, you know, Israeli officials to rape someone because we say so. Um, you know, I hadn't heard that, you know, that particular story before, um, but uh, I understand now where, you know, some of these people are coming from. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure there is any kind of uh, 
justification of rate. I mean, I, I, that doesn't sound right to me. But the, um, uh, yes, one of the aspects of this story, of course, is that it seems to um, authorize the rabbis to decide whatever they want to decide. And remember, we are not all rabbis. That is, the, there is a particular caste here um, that uh, has this power, but everybody outside the caste does not. And that's clearly a big issue. And, and one could certainly say that the process of secularization is a rebellion against rabbinical authority and an attempt to say, we will all decide, not just you. So, that, so the, on that score, you've made a very important point, I think, uh, that we all have to remember. Um, now, it turns out that story, I didn't give you the whole story, but um, as uh, Jeffrey Rubenstein has, has argued in, a, in, I think, a brilliant interpretation of the story, the story really isn't about actually what I said it's about. It actually is about the question of um, uh, how do you treat somebody who's in the minority? Because the rabbis go and they ban him, and they burn everything that he declared permitted. Uh, they humiliate him, uh, and in the end, he, uh, he kind of gets his, uh, his uh, revenge on them. But uh, so the point there seems to be that, yes, uh, in rabbinic culture, minority opinions are preserved, and you should not humili humiliate the person in the minority. So it has actually another, the story has another function altogether. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, often, uh, quoted in the sense that I've that I've used it. Yes. Um, with the ongoing uh, wrestling between secular and religious, I'm, I kind of reminded of a recent book about baseball about the umpires and the players. Um, the umpires do what they have to do in a ball game, but a lot of players wish the umpires weren't part of the ball game. Um, but some players understand it, some don't. And with this sort of very loose analogy, um, do we really, do we need umpires to continue? A, uh, I'm not quite sure how to form the question, but I'm just think of that battle that needs to be, and without an umpire, can things just go on, a game can go on? Or do we need umpires? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so if I can translate your, your question. <laughs> Uh, into a, uh, uh, so I mean, if you don't have umpires, I guess that would be anarchism, right? So, um, you know, and some people take that position. Uh, I think the situation we have today is that we have multiple sources of authority. Um, you don't just have a, an orthodox rabbinate. I mean, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, the rebellion against the rabbis was a rebellion against a, what appeared to be a kind of homogeneous rabbinate. Um, and <clears throat> today, that's not the case. I mean, we have such a um, plurality of people who claim to speak for the tradition um, that it's no longer possible. I mean, we don't have a Vatican, thank God. And therefore, <laughs> or whomever. And, uh, uh, or whomever. And, and therefore, we don't, um, we have multiple authorities. and. Um, and that's, you know, and that's a good thing, because it means that there are now multiple interpretations of this tradition that inform different communities uh, rather than just one interpretation informing just one community. OK, I, unfortunately, it sounds like we have to um, conclude this session, but it's a wonderful beginning. Of